Dear viewers, today we have a very special program that will be presented in a lecture format without any distractions. Our very esteemed guest is Professor Edward Erickson, who will speak on the topic entitled A Global History of Relocation in Counterinsurgency Warfare. This is the title of his book, which was published last year and can be obtained from Amazon. Let me, let me show you the book. I have the book. It is excellent reading in spite of the very difficult topic, and I re recommend it highly for any people interested in the history of warfare and uh, relocations. Dr. Edward Erickson is a professor of international relations at Antalya Bilim University and a retired professor of military history from the Department of War Studies at the Marine Corps University. He is also a retired regular United States Army Lieutenant Colonel with multiple combat tours in the field artillery and additional experience as a foreign area officer specializing in the Middle East. Dr. Erickson is recognized as an authority on the First World War in the Middle East and the Turkish military policy. He has more than 17 books, many of them on Ottoman military campaigns. Additionally, he is the co-author of an excellent book on the Turkish military intervention in Cyprus called Pays Van Attila, the Amphibious Campaign for Cyprus. I strongly recommend that you review Dr. Erickson's impressive CV, to which we gave a link for the, in the flyer. Task TV is on YouTube and Facebook and on other social media platforms. It is now broadcast 24 hours a day. We thank Professor Erickson and welcome him and can start the lecture. Ah, great. Boy, uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And hello to my friends uh, in, in the District of Columbia and in the TASC viewing audience. Uh, Duan, let's start the, sli the slide presentation. Okay, so so this is the title is a global history of relocation and counterinsurgency warfare. This is this is the book title. It's not the one I would have chosen, uh, but the publisher chose it for for some reasons that I'll elaborate on in a minute. Next slide, please. So that's that's the cover. Uh, this is I am the editor of the volume. It was published in 2020 by Bloomsbury Academic uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so it's an, it's an academic study of a global phenomenon. It is, it is uh, available in hardback, paperback, and, and by an ebook uh, e as well. Um, the book is about decision-making. It's not about the hardships of people who are moved into concentration camps. It's not about what happens to people in the camps or in the relocation centers once they get there. This, this is about military decision-making and the decisions to move uh, people who are thought to be a threat to national security to places other than their homes. Uh, I'll tell you who the individual in the picture is as we get going. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of put you back in high school a little bit and talk a little bit about what is history uh, hist what it is, what it is not, and, and then the importance of establishing context. Uh, the the idea that that there's that there's more outside the little keyhole view that we might otherwise get when we study a very narrow topic. I'll, I'll cover a few of the more interesting historical cases. Uh, I'll then talk about the Ottoman experience in particular, and then some conclusions about the global strategy and relocation in context. And maybe if we have time, a question and answer. Next slide. So, so what is history? Uh, Jenny McLeod is a Gallipoli historian. Uh, history is a selection of facts and events from the past, 
with a pattern of meaning and significance imposed on them. The important word is selection of facts. Historians select the facts to present to you. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, the famous American historian uh, who, who, who wrote a book called The End of History. Of course, it didn't end. Uh, but uh, kind of a metaphorical, allegorical uh, way to look at it. History is a handmaiden who you may clothe as you wish. That, that means that you can use history as a tool. You can, you can put a different spin, a different bent, a different narrative on a historical fact and, and interpret it uh, in a different way according to the audience. This is what I've come to regard myself as. Uh, historians are curators of facts. Uh, much like a museum curator organizes and presents exhibits, we historians organize and present facts. Next slide. Okay, there, there's the book again. Uh, I call this curating history. I, I have I have selected, I'm the editor of the book. Uh, I am also the author of the chapter on the, the, the relocation of American Japanese, uh, Japanese American residents from California in 1942. I also wrote the conclusion and the introduction. But but my main job as the editor is is to select carefully representative campaigns, representative relocation operations that were conducted in modern times uh, during wartime. And, and my choice uh, were the following, eight counterinsurgency campaigns against insurgents, uh, one counter indigenous campaign, which is against American Native American Indians, one counter guerrilla campaign against the Boers in South Africa, and two fifth column campaigns. In, in fact, the American relocation in 1942 of the Japanese American population of the West Coast is a counter fifth column campaign. I, I, will, I will talk about this in, in a minute. So I'm the curator, I'm the, I'm the decider, to use George Bush's word, as to what, what goes in this book and what does not go in this book. Next slide. This is, this is a pretty compelling map. I think uh, we had this made for the book. Uh, it, relocation in warfare is a global phenomenon. And, and we see this starting in 1755 to 1973, uh, over a 200 year period. Uh, we see people relocated during wartime on four of the six continents inhabited by humans. Uh, there may be more, uh, but these are the ones that, that I picked and the ones that are most representative. Sadly, you'll see the United States listed three times on this map. Uh, you'll see the British listed uh, several times. You, you'll see the French, the, the, the Republic of Vietnam, a country that's no longer in existence since 1975. You'll see Russians and Ottomans. Uh, so, so, so this is, I, I think, a remarkable pattern that emerges from the study of this topic. Six continents, four of which are inhabited, four of the six continents inhabited by humans have this phenomenon at different points. Next slide. Okay, this is a, I don't read this, but just kind of listen to me. The, the, the research question, historians uh, always start with a research question. What, what are we trying to discover? What are we trying to answer in this book? And, and, and the research question is, why move people? Why move people to camps by design? This is not a random event. This is not something that's done spontaneously for specious reasons. This is a military strategy that's done by design to achieve a specific end state militarily. These are not extermination camps. Uh, I, I've already gone through the, the countries involved, but, but the names of the camps uh, La Reconcentración, the Spanish, reservations for American Indians, zones of protection for Filipinos, concentration camps in South Africa, relocation camps for Armenians. Um, I'll skip the next one and talk about that. Internment camps for Japanese Americans, new villages for ethnic Chinese in Malaya, villagization for, for Mau Mau rebels in Kenya. 
regroupment centers for, for Algerians, strategic hamlets for Vietnamese, and finally El Diamento for the rebels and the inhabitants of the Portuguese colonies. So, so, so the word camp is deceptive. The word counterinsurgency warfare is deceptive. The, this is a number of cases. The, the, the common theme in the whole book is these occur in wartime, and they occur in wartime because the governments, the militaries involved, believe these people are a threat to national security or a threat to the security of the colony or the occupied area. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is a unique event. This is not what I'm talking about. The Holocaust is a singularly unique event. These are extermination camps. We call them concentration camps, of course, but they're really extermination camps. And six million European Jews are ultimately sent during wartime to these extermination camps. For example, uh, Auschwitz, Birkenau, Furstenfeldberg, um, those, those types of places where, where people were gassed and, and and put to death and then cremated. These people, the Jewish population of Europe, were not moved because they were thought to be a threat to national security. They were not moved because they were dangerous. They were not moved for any other reason than the fact that they were Jewish and they were moved to be killed. So, so when we hear the word concentration camp, this is what we think of. This is not in the book because this is not a military decision. This is a political decision made by Hitler's government outside of the military campaigns fought during that war to kill these people. So this is a different case and it's totally unique. Nothing like this in, in human history, modern human history. Next slide. Okay. The, the modern era, when do we start the modern era? Most of we historians started in 1648 with, with the, the, uh, 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 the, the rise of the nation state. But I'm gonna start it for our purposes in, in 1604. The French colonized North America. They, they, they colonized what's now Canada originally. And, and a French colony uh, now called uh, uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, the Maritime, uh, colonies are 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 discovered and, and colonized by the French in 1604, and and they they live there for over a hundred years. And in 1745, the British conquer militarily these maritime provinces, these little islands off the coast, and and the peninsula now called Nova Scotia. So 1745, the French inhabitants are now. Uh, dwellers in occupied territory. Next slide. Okay, this is called the Acadian Removal, and it happens on August 10th, 1755. That's a statue of Evangeline, a young Acadian maiden. It's fictional. There is no such person, but this statue is in a place called Grand Pre, Nova Scotia. That's a French-sounding name, French town, but there's no French people living there anymore. How come? Next slide. A very famous American poet, uh, one of our poet laureates named Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a famous epic poem. It's a romance. It's a, it's a, it's a break your heart romance about separation and loss. And he writes this in 1847 and it's called Evangeline, A Tale of Acadia. The, the question in the opening stanza is where did these people go to? This is the forest primeval. It's a very famous opening line. It's, it's a forest. And, 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 but where are the hearts that used to live here? Where are the people? Where are, what happened to the thatched roof villages? They're gone. And, and Longfellow's answer is, as we see it here, waste are these pleasant farms and farmers forever departed, scattered like the dust and the leaves far across the ocean. So, so this is this is a song about a, a fictional character named Evangeline who's separated from her betrothed, handsome boyfriend. Uh, and and uh, it's very tragic. Uh, on the 10th of August, 1755, the French inhabitants of the occupied colony have been in rebellion for 10 years. 
the British are finally to the point where they, they think the best solution is to remove everybody. And, and 12,000 Acadians are permanently exiled. All the, inhab all the French inhabitants are, are taken away and sent some back to France, some to French colonies, some to the 13 colonies, but they're gone. So what happens to them? Next slide. The Acadians, if you're familiar with the word Cajun, Cajuns live in New Orleans. They live in Louisiana. Louisiana is a, originally a French colony, speak French. And, and the, the Cajuns are, are, is a bastardization of the word Acadian. So, so the answer to Longfellow's question, his rhetorical question is, a lot of them wind up in New Orleans and they famously become Cajuns, Cajun food, uh, blackened redfish and, and spicy sauce. Uh, uh, they're famous for it. So, so that's what happens to the Cajuns. Not, not all the outcomes are, are, this, are this friendly. Next slide. Uh, relocation in the modern era, the United States does it quite frequently with, with uh, uh, American Indians. The Navajo uh, in, in 1865 are famously moved in what's come down to us as the long walk of the Navajo. Uh, they, they, they are fighting the occupation of their lands by the United States Army. And, and eventually the United States, the, the military commanders out there get so sick and tired of it, they, they can't seem to end the irregular warfare that the, the, the Navajo are doing. And, and, and so they, they literally pack up the Navajo nation, all the survivors, uh, men, women, ch children, dogs, horses, and they, and, they, and they force them to walk um, from what's now New Mexico down to a reservation called Redondo Reservation. So, so we, we do this in a number of cases. This is representative of the American um, movement relocation of American Indians. This is in 1865. So we're moving from, from 1755 to 1865. Now we're going to move up to, to 1895. Next slide. This, this is General Ver, Ver, Ver uh, I can't say his name, uh, Veriliano uh, Weiler. Uh, and, and we just know him, the, the yellow press in, in the progressive era nicknames him Butcher Weiler and and the slaughter of insurgents, the torturing of insurgents in Cuba in 1895 becomes a cause celeb in the Western world, particular in, in particularly in the American Congress. Uh, Weiler defines the vocabulary. He comes up with the word reconcentration. I'm going to move all of the families of the guerrillas from their houses, their homes, and villages to camps. I'm going to reconcentrate them. And, and it's a word that now becomes a legacy vocabulary for the next uh, 100 years. Next slide. General Weiler also defines the strategy. What, what you see in circles are troca. Those are fortified lines, barbed wire, blockhouses, uh, pillboxes, put across the island of Cuba. And that, 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 divides the island into three manageable sectors. So we're, we're going to come back to this idea of sectorization. So within each sector, you know, he starts in the West first, it's the smallest one, and he moves all, he reconcentrates all of, all of the families of the guerrillas uh, into camps, and then he sweeps the sectors clean of guerrillas. So, so the Spanish are responsible for the vocabulary and the strategy as it comes down to us. Next slide. Uh, the United States, we in the Spanish-American War gather up some territories. We gather up Puerto Rico and, and Cuba for a while and Guam and the Philippine Islands. And after the United States in 1899 uh, acquires the Philippine Islands, the, the people, many of the people in different parts of, of the island, Luzon, for example, Mindanao and Samar, rebel against American occupation. They, they're tired of the Spanish and they don't want the Americans to become a, simply another occupying oppressive government. So we focus on, on in the book, The Island of Samar. And, and what you see, that, that, that fellow there, uh, Jake, Jacob Smith, is the general in charge of Samar. His instructions to the Marine Corps major running the counterinsurgency effort is I want to turn, I want you, Major Waller, to turn the island of Samar into a howling 
wilderness. And, and historians, very quickly, the, the, the yellow press, the media, start, they, 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 they put a label on, on Jake Smith, and he's called Howling Jake Smith. And they do turn it into a howling wilderness. They move everybody into a, in, into a camp, and, and the word he uses is zones of protection. Same thing. We were talking about a concentration camp by, by any other any other word. And, and they move the people into the camps. They then sector the island and they sweep through with patrols uh, and military raids and, and capture or kill all of the guerrillas. Within two years, the insurgency is defeated. And, and this, it worked in Cuba for Weiler. It worked in in in. In Acadia for the British, it works for us in the Philippines. Next slide. Uh, the most uh, oh this 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 is you, you heard of waterboarding? You know we uh, the George Bush administration uh, waterboarded prisoners uh, that we captured in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's a cause celeb in our time. A cause celeb in 1900 was something that my army. I'm a, I'm an American soldier. My army invented what they called the water. Cure. And what you see is a funnel on the left-hand side of the Life magazine, uh, a funnel inserted into the mouth of a, of a, of a Filipino guerrilla, a Filipino insurgency, and they pour water into the poor fellow's mouth until his stomach expands and he, and he can no longer breathe. So, so it's not exactly the same as water boarding, but this is a lineal this, this, is, this is a lineal ancestor of waterboarding. It's horrific. This was famous. There were Senate investigations. We finally stopped doing it. The United States Army was finally forced by, by, by the Senate to stop doing the water cure. Next slide. Uh, the most famous episodes in, in, at, of the time are the Boer War atrocities that occur for three years from 1899 to 1901. The British occupy what's now part of South Africa where Boers, it's a name for, for Dutch colonists who, 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 who have a couple free countries, the Orange Free State, for example. Uh, and, and the British occupy the Boer nations because they want the diamonds and gold, the, the, the huge backstory there. Uh, and, and the Boers rebel. So these are Boer guerrillas. Uh, not rebelling against the government, but they're guerrillas. Uh, they're not insurgents. They're, they're simply trying to retake their country from the occupiers. The British strategy is pretty simple. Those are Boer guerrillas on the right, uh, uh, civilian irregulars. And on the left are the Boer farmsteads. And, and the British strategy is very similar to, to what Weiler and, and, and Howling Jake Smith did uh, Previously, the strategy is to separate the guerrillas from the population. The guerrillas need food. They need water. They need supplies. They need fresh horses. They, they need all this stuff. You just can't go out in the countryside and, and, and stay there for a long period without food, water, horses, munitions. So, so if, if, you can cut, if you can cut that lifeline between the guerrillas and the population that, that, that they come from, you can win the war. And this does win the war for the British after a three year period. It takes them a long time. Next slide. Uh, they, 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 when they built their sectors, they, they built 8,000. This is called a blockhouse. Every kilometer has one of these. And from this blockhouse, you can see the next one going forward. You can turn around, look back, and see the next one looking back. So they have what they call interlocking fields of fire. From one blockhouse, I can, I can see the other blockhouse, and, and, and with our rifles, we, we can cover the ground. And in between the ground, you'll see some of the barbed wire in that picture, 6,000 kilometers of barbed wire. This is a major effort. This takes half a million British soldiers to do this. This is a huge effort. Next slide. Uh, this is this you can see on the map those lines that, that, that you see that they're not very distinct uh, on the computer but but those are where they go these, these these huge blockhouse lines that go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles that establish and and and, and, and they, they they chop the, the countryside into sectors and as they chop these these sectors uh, apart they they then move all the people 
and, and they burn the houses, they poison the wells, they kill all the cattle and the sheep. So while the British are doing this, there's something like 300,000 livestock, cattle and sheep who are butchered and left to rot, thrown down the wells to poison them, to keep them out of the hands of the guerrillas. The Boer, the Boer War also, in, in our collective memory, defines the end state. Next slide. This is the end state of the Boer War, the concentration camps. The guerrillas who, who, who are, are hunted down in the sectors, they're either dead or they're sent to concentration camps, to prisoner of war camps, in this case on the island of Ceylon. So, so that's where that's where the Boer guerrillas wind up. The civilians, black and white, wind up in camps, and and this is where our modern term term of concentration camps come from. It's the English version of Weiler's reconcentration. It is also a co uh, cause celeb. These are not extermination camps. However, there's not very much food in the camps for the, for the for the the detainees there's very little medical care the water supplies are 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 uh, are polluted uh, it's kind of like texas right now there is no water in some camps you, you can know where to go um and 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 so so the death toll is quite high and we find this to be a signature of relocation not because they're the the government that, that's relocating people intends them to die, but it's an outcome. In the American Civil War, the American Civil War, there are some famous prisoner of war camps. The Confederacy has one in, in Andersonville, Georgia. The United States has one in Elmira, New York. And the death toll in both those camps are very high because nutrition, uh, medical care, good clean water, uh, disease runs rampant. This is an era before antibiotics vaccinations don't they won't stop things like typhus very well so 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 lots of boars die in these camps and it becomes a, a really a bad entry into the 20th century if you will next slide okay let's talk a little bit about the ottomans and 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 military logistics like gorillas soldiers need food and ammunition and fodder for their animals and medical supplies and replacements men uh, uh, howitzers, uh, spare parts. And, and in particular, the Ottoman armies are deployed on the frontiers. And the ones we're looking at in 1915 are the 4th in Palestine, the 6th Army in Mesopotamia, and the 3rd Army up in the Caucasus. Those red lines, though, those are notional. But what I mean is for the 3rd Army to survive up in the mountains by Sarakamish and Kars and, and Old Oltu and, and those places, uh, Ardahan, they, they can't live up there without supplies from Istanbul. That's the, the hub where everything comes from. So if you can cut those lines, if you can somehow interdict, stop, cut those lines and stop those supplies from flowing out to the, the third, fourth and sixth army, you, you can cause those armies to wither on the vine like a plant that doesn't have water. That's, it, it works. Next slide. The, the rebellion at Van is the most well-known. These are insurgents uh, in the lower left-hand corner. Those, those are they're kind of a bourgeois-looking group. They're highly educated. They're members of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. Some are, some are in the ARF, some are Hunchaks, some are Dashnaks. But, but the, the spark that ignites this is the, the famous rebellion in Van in April 1915. Um, the, the Russian army with, with Armenian Druzny, uh, Armenian legions, attacks from the east, and the rebels inside seize the city. That's that's the start of they're one of one of the proximate causes of the Armenian rebellion. Next slide. In addition, the committees commit terrorist activities all through Anatolia. Um, they blow up bridges. They 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 destroy. Uh, police stations. They they chop down telephone telegraph lines. They 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 ambush patrols and and they start to start start to interdict what we military people call the lines of communications. Those red lines two slides ago, those are called lines of communications. And and in this case, you, you'll see the terrorism. Uh, a few of the incidents overlaid on the road network. This they don't have railroads. 
in eastern Anatolia at this time. All they had were roads. They didn't have, they didn't have motorized trucks. On these roads, they got to move stuff by ox cart and by, by wagons pulled by horses. So, so this starts to affect the Third Army up in the Caucasus in particular, as the Ottoman committee, as the, as the Ottoman Armenian committees cut those lines of communications, it has adverse effects on the Third Army. They, they don't have the forces available to go out and hunt down the guerrillas because they're hard fighting already, the Russians in, in Anatolia. And Gallipoli happens on, on April 25th. So, so forces, such forces that are available that would normally go to counterinsurgency, go to the Gallipoli Peninsula to reinforce the Fifth Army or to the Third Army in, in the Caucasus. Next slide. The solution is this. I, I call Talat's memorandum the problem statement. What is the problem? Some of the Armenians, not all the Armenians, some of the Armenians in certain places have done everything they could to obstruct the operations of the army against the enemy. They prevented the delivery of supplies, munitions to the soldiers on the battlefield. They collaborated with the enemy and some of them even joined the enemy's ranks. But the operational thing I would point out is we we see here they prevented the delivery of supplies and munitions. Those terrorist acts stopped supplies from moving. This is a problem. I call this a problem statement. Well, what's the solution? Here's the solution. Next slide. This is the Sultan's decree uh, of May 31st. This is world famous. If you open up any book on, on what some authors call the Armenian genocide, you will see this. That the, this this is. This is supposedly the, the, the start of, of the Ottoman uh, Armenian genocide. It's not. Whatever you think about the Ottoman Armenian genocide, this is, this is simply uh, a, a campaign design. How do we stop that problem? Well, the conduct of such rebel elements render it necessary to remove them. We're going to remove them from the areas of military operations and evacuate the villages serving as bases of operations and shelters for the rebels. So, so what the government is saying, the Sultan didn't write this, of course, Talat Pasha, Andrew Pasha probably wrote it. Uh, but, but this is a solution. We're, we're going to do what the Boers did. We're going to do what the Americans did. We're going to do what the Spanish did. We're going to do what the British did. We're going to move these people out of their villages in somewhere else. And, and then, we're, then, then, then we'll have enough forces available to, to crush the rebellion. And it works. This, within, within, within four months of this, the rebellion is pretty much crushed and extinguished. What happens next? What happens to the people? Longfellow's question, what happens to the people? Next slide. Uh, this is the area that's affected. This is this is this is the area that the Sultan's decree talks about. Not everywhere, not Istanbul, not Izmir, not 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 uh, not uh, Konya, but 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 a local. This is a localized problem that's tied directly to the supply lines that go from Istanbul up to the Third Army. Next slide. This is a very busy slide. Don't 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 don't. Just kind of let me talk you through this. What happens to the people? About, about 350,000 Ottoman Armenians never leave their houses. The Ottomans, Armenians living in Istanbul and, and Izmir and, and Balakashir and Konya, th th those people stay in their houses up till the end of the war. They're not moved because they're not the problem. The people who are moved in, in the dark shaded area, a lot of them flee to Russia. We don't know how many, but but the Russian records suggest anywhere from three, 250 to 300,000 Ottoman Armenians wind up as refugees in the Russian Empire. Uh, another, and again, we don't know the numbers, 300,000, 400, we don't quite know, but but the Ottoman Armenians living in that shaded area wind up in, in, in internment camps, concentration camps, many of which are down in the Euphrates Valley in what's now Syria, near a place called Deir el Zor. But that's not the only place. There are camps up near uh, Adana. There are camps near Iskenderun. And, and so they're kind of spread out along that area. Uh, Jamal Pasha stops many of them from, from actually being sent as far away as the Euphrates Valley. And, and, and there are mini camps 
established up, up near Antioch and Iskenderun and Adana. Uh, the, nobody really wants to talk much about, about this. What, what, what the world wants to talk about is how many were killed, why were they killed? Uh, you know, a, 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 the Armenian diaspora will, will say a, a million and a half. 1.2 million Armenian, uh, Ottoman Armenians were killed. Uh, so some Turks will say hardly any. Uh, I, I like the number 350,000. How do I get that number? I, I, I take the known population. But there were about a million and a half Ottoman Armenians before the war living, living in the Ottoman Empire. We know that 350,000 survived, let, never left their homes during the entire war. We know that, that a certain amount went to Russia. We know that a certain amount were evacuated to camps. And that leaves me with a, and, and I'm challenged mathematically. I'm not a math guy. Uh, that leaves me with a number of about 350,000. So, so that's the outcome of, of, of the relocation by 1917. Next slide. The Russians do it too. That, that area is called the Pale Settlement or the Settlement of the Pale. And, and it, it is inhabited by, by, by many, about three million Jewish people, many of whom came from Spain during the Reconquista. Most Americans, if you say what happened in 1492, they'll say, well, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. A European will often tell you that's the day, that's the, the year of the Reconquista when Spain expels the Muslims and the Jews. King Ferdinand and Isabella expelled all the Jews who wouldn't convert. A lot of them wind up here in Eastern Europe. Well, they speak a, they speak a language called Yiddish, which sounds like German. And, and many of them have, have relatives living in Austria, Hungary, and Germany. So, so the Jews living in the Pale are thought to be a threat, a fifth column threat to the Russians fighting the Germans. And the czar and the general staff decides to move them. So anywhere from, we don't know, maybe a million. Most of the books talk about three million people. That whole area, that's a big area, by the way. If it goes from the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea. Those Jewish inhabitants are moved, sent into the interior, not to camps, but just to cities. They're kind of just let loose in cities in the interior. We really don't know what happens to them. I bring it up because they're moved for the same reason that the Americans move the, 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 Amer the Japanese American population. They're thought to be a threat. They aren't in rebellion. They aren't helping the enemy. Uh, they, they, they simply look different and, and talk a different language and they're thought to be a threat. This is happening at the same time, the exact same year that the, the Ottomans are moving the Ottoman Armenians. Next slide. This is a chapter I wrote in the book, uh, the Japanese American internment. Uh, that area on the West Coast, we move uh, maybe 120, 150,000 American citizens who are Japanese Americans in 1942 out of that area. They aren't in revolt. They're not helping the enemy. They're, they're loyal citizens, but they're Japanese. And after Pearl Harbor, they're thought to be a threat, not necessarily to rebel, but the West Coast is where we, that, that, that's the, the epicenter of our, our aircraft industry. We're building B-17s and P-40s and B-24s. The aircraft factories are thought to be endangered by these people. Next slide. There they are. They're American citizens. Uh, we don't tattoo them on their left arm with a number. They're not going to extermination camps. So we don't tattoo a number, but we do put a shoe tag on. <laughs> Look at those shoe tags. Every, every one of them has a little tag and it says their name and their birth date and where they were from and where they're going to go. So we tag them. We tag them. This, this is kind of like tagging, you know, catch and release, if you will. We, we catch them, we tag them, we send them off to a camp. It's, this, this, is, this, is not, this is not America that, that I am proud of. Next slide. This will look familiar. We don't put them in boxcars like the Nazis, but we put them. That, that's not, if you're in that line next to the passenger car, that's not a good place to be. You're going somewhere with your little shoe tag. They're American soldiers. So this looks a lot like the, the, the evacuation of Jews from Europe to me, only a little more friendly. We're, we're not going to kill them. We're not tattooing them. We're shoe tagging them. Next slide. They could bring what they could carry. 
Um, this happened to the Jews of Europe. When they got to Auschwitz, all the stuff was 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 taken. But but whatever they could carry, they put in box cars. They 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 then went into the passenger cars in California. Uh, not not a good not a good picture. Next slide. This is the most famous camp that they go to, Manzanar. There's a very famous autobiographical novel called uh, Farewell to Manzanar. So 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 these are Japanese. These are these are American citizens. These were citizens of my country. And and the signature. What I would point out is there's barbed wire. And you can't see it, but inside the barbed wire, there's a little, there's a little, there's another little wire called the deadline. If you you can't walk up to the barbed wire, you have to walk past a, a line, a, a a a wire, and if you walk past that wire toward the barbed wire fence, they'll shoot you. These are Americans. This this is these are Americans. The barbed wire becomes a signature of all camps. The Boer War. Uh, Cuba, Manzanar, and so forth. Next slide. Uh, after World War II, you may have heard the phrase in, in, in reference to the war in Vietnam, hearts and minds. Sounds friendly. Uh, we don't need to kill them. We just need to get their hearts and minds on our side. And this, this, this is a phrase attributed to Sir Gerald Templer, the, 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 the man who orchestrated the the uh, the counterinsurgency in Malaya. That's on the right hand side. That's that's Templar's map, and he put pins in the map. He drew in sectors. He put pins in the map, and as as they as they moved, five hundred thousand ethnic Chinese who look different than other Malayans. Malayans are are Indo Polynesian different. You know they're they're not Chinese people, but but the people who were rebelling against the British in 1953 were ethnic Chinese, and he moves them. You'll see on the western side of the peninsula on that map to what he calls new villages, not concentration camps. Come on, put a, I'm going to label it differently. I'm going to make it sound more user friendly. I'm going to call them new villages. Next slide. So there's the public face of a new village. You know, this is they, they got they got fresh water, they got they got food, they've got a, a, a better place to live than they used to live in their little their little village out there. Um, next slide. But this is this is the non-public. This is about population control. Barbed wire. Those new villages have barbed wire, and you can't go in and out of them at, at, at will. There's a curfew at night. If you leave in the day, it's like a work release in a prison. You got to come back. Got to have an ID card. They check your vehicle. If you're carrying a handbag or a basket, they're going to look inside and make sure you're not bringing out stuff to aid the guerrillas. So so it sounds benign. New villages sounds benign, but it's a form of population control. Uh, as as bad as anything else. Next slide. Uh, the, the, one of the largest movements is called quadrillage to to break it into quarters. Uh, in Algeria, the French do this when when the Algerians rebel in the late 1940s. Uh, by 1958, the, the, they have relocated almost two million people uh, to camps, and and they they've broken Algeria into sectors, as we see here. Uh, and and crush. They win this by 1958 when De Gaulle becomes president. They've won this war, uh, believe it or not. Next slide. They they call they don't call them concentration camps. Uh, they don't call them new villages. They call them regroupment centers. There are some Algerian children standing uh, in the left hand photograph, and you can make out the barbed wire. There it is again, the barbed wire. There's a barbed wire enclosure. Barbed wire goes all around this camp. Uh, in, in the photo on the right, you can see a watchtower. Manzanar had watchtowers. Guards are up in those watchtowers with, with arms, with weapons. <laughs> and if you get too close to the wire, they're going to warn you once, and then they're going to shoot you. So this, this is not a, a, a particularly good place to be either, regroupment centers. Next slide. Okay, I'm kind of coming to the end here. I hope I haven't talked too long or bored you to tears. There is a context. The Ottoman-Armenian relocation does not occur as a singularly unique event in history. It is similar to at least 11 other cases. What's common to these cases? These are strategic decisions made during wartime. They didn't relocate Ottoman Armenians before the war. They didn't relocate them after the war. They're, they're relocated during the war for a strategic reason. 
And the decision is made to separate the people from the guerrillas, from the insurgents. The strategy is not designed to exterminate people. It's unlike the Holocaust. The, the, the intent is, is to simply confine people, uh, not exterminate them. However, in the days before antibiotics, in the days before food distribution is widely available, in the days before the UNHCR, in the days before those types of, of things, people go to these camps and they die, just like the American Civil War prisoner camps in, in Elmira, New York, and Andersonville, Georgia. Uh, next, the, the, they're, they're always different. You know, the, the, the word we use popularly today in history is the other, the other. The other is different. The other has a different religion, has a different color skin. They're an ethnic minority. They speak a different language. They're easily identifiable. The, the Acadians spoke French. The Navajos were Indi American Indians. The Ottoman Armenians were Ottoman Armenians and, 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 and had a different name. They were Christians. Uh, the ethnic Chinese in Malaya were ethnic Chinese, not Malayans. So, so they're always different. The American, uh, Japanese Americans are different. They're an ethnic minority. And, and importantly, they're always believed to be a threat to national security. And if not to national security, at least to the regional local areas. The Navajo, on the long walk of the Navajo in 1865, they're not a threat to the nation. The threat is the Confederacy. We're in the middle of the Civil War. We're ending the Civil War. But they're a threat regionally. Those Navajo warriors are a, th are a threat to, to isolated farms and settlers in the New Mexico and Arizona territory. So they're, they're easily identifiable. They are the other, to use that word, and they're believed to be a threat. Uh, they believe the people who make the decision, decisions believe that they support the insurgency. The Ottoman Armenians. Only a small part of the Ottoman Armenians supported the committees. Think about it. How many terrorists do you need to make a difference? How many terrorists were in America on 9-11? How many terrorists took our Capitol building on January 6th, 2021? You don't need a lot of them. You don't need thousands, millions of insurgents. You only need a few in key locations like on those lines of communications, in the Capitol building, in, 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 in settled areas in the New Mexico territory. You don't need to have a lot of them, but, but you do have to believe that those people, those easily identifiable people, those others are supporting the insurgency. Always, always the decision makers establish some kind of a zone. It's not just everywhere. It's not all over the Ottoman Empire. It's not all over Russia. It's not all over Malaya. It's not every island in the Philippines. There's a certain area that's thought to be, and, and the decision makers use a word like infested, infested with insurgents. So they establish a zone, and then, then, then they will chop it up into sectors and remove the people. They remove the inhabitants to camps. And we saw there are a variety of names, uh, aldiamentos, zones of protection. Uh, my favorite, zones of protection. It sounds so benign. It sounds like we're going to help people. New villages, recruitment centers. So, so they take them to these camps. The death toll varies. We, we, were, we were the best of all of them. The American experience in 1942, the Japanese Americans, hardly anybody dies. They're American citizens. We, we establish schools. We open medical clinics. We give them good food and clean water. And in fact, a number of the young men will even enlist from those camps to join the American army, fighting the Germans, the famous Nisi Japanese, the 100th Battalion, famous. Some of, some of those men, the highest percentage of, of Medal of Honor winners of any unit in the United States Army during that war, amazing thing. Uh, and, and the last, the desired military outcome is generally successful. It works, whether we like it or not, this, this is a, a horrible, horrific, awful thing to do to human beings. But, but it works. The, the, the rebellions are crushed. They're ended. The British, the French, the Americans, the, 
the 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 Spanish they the, the they 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 end the rebellions on favorable terms. So so as horrific as this is, if you're a military person and you're trying to end a rebellion, crush an insurgency, this worked. Next slide. Coming to the end here. So there it is one more time. Just 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 to kind of just to kind of recover what what I've been talking about. We see this on four or six continents. I don't know that it didn't happen in South America. Uh, I, I just can't quite quite find uh, good examples. Um, I, it, it, the Aborigines in Australia were removed, but not during wartime. So why don't we see Australia? Why don't we see Australian Aborigines uh, shifted or moved? And the answer is because Australia didn't move them for wartime purposes. So so these these are these are the most important, the largest examples. Uh, it has occurred, it's from 1755, right up until the Portuguese, the last gasp, the dying gasp of this atrocity-laden, terrible strategy is, is, is in what's now Mozambique and Angola and, and those Portuguese colonies in Southern Africa in 1973, and the Portuguese finally decide to leave. Last slide. Okay, what would we say? 220 years of relocation. What, what are my conclusions? It, it's used by the great powers. This, this, this is a Western-centric great power endeavor that, that, that is acceptable to the governments and to the militaries of, of the great powers that I've talked about previously. And it goes on, it goes on for 220 years. It was an actual military strategy. This was not something that we go back and 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 retrofit and say, yeah, we think we did it. They we think they did it for these reasons. We know from the documents, we know from the historical record, when we curate the archives, these are the conclusions we come to. This is an actual military strategy and it's used globally. It is inconvenient as hell for, for any of us who live in these countries as a narrative. It's very inconvenient for Americans to talk about. Most Americans don't want to talk about the Japanese relocations. They don't want to talk about moving American Indians to reservations. Um, this, is, this is a very inconvenient narrative for, for all of us. Uh, I, I'm horror as a historian, it just appalled as a soldier, American soldier, I'm appalled that, that, that we invented that thing called the water cure, cure, the water cure to torture Filipino insurgents to give us information about what their units. Uh, the arguments today uh, revolve around, were the decision makers criminals? Were, were, were the people who made these decisions criminals or not? I can't answer that. that. That's not what I do. I don't make a judgment. I will tell you what the facts are. I will tell you the outcomes. I will tell you why they did it. But this is for the audience to, to mull over and, and, and consider uh, their, their own personal answer to this question. Were they criminals or, or were they military and, and civil leaders trying to win a war with the tools that come to hand? The, the next one, are modern nations accountable? Uh, I'm sorry, go back one. Yeah, are modern nations accountable today for the past? Th does Turkey have, have any obligation to the descendants of the Ottoman Armenians? Does Turkey owe them reparations? Should Turkey give them their lost property back? Um, should in, in my country, slavery, it's a separate issue, but many black Americans think that the United States government today should give reparations to black Americans. The American Indians, should, should the American Indians with, with legal treaties that, that, that give them theoretically Oklahoma, the entire state, should should they get their state back? Should they get Indian territory, which becomes Oklahoma? So this this, this is also a, a an intrusive question into the modern age. How responsible are we? My, my family comes here in in the 1880s. You know, so so my family has nothing to do with the American Indians, for they come from Sweden. You know, what is it? Is it my job? Is is it my liability to to recompense American Indians for what they've lost? Uh, you know, these 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 are tough questions for the modern world. Okay, that pretty much concludes what I've got. Next slide. Uh, you can write down my email address. I'm happy to answer questions 
by email for the audience if you have any questions uh, about what I've talked about. Uh, I am a professor of international relations. Uh, the uh, the the book is is available if you if you Google a global history of relocation and counterinsurgency warfare. You can find that book on Amazon. You can find it on eBay. You can go directly to the publisher in the UK, um, Bloomsburg Publishing. So it's been a real pleasure to talk about this. Uh, it's a subject that's fascinating to me. Uh, I don't have judgments. I just have uh, answers as to why the decision makers decided to do what they did at the time with the tools that they have. Oya, well, yeah, thank you very much, and my compliments to you and the, the Turkish American Steering Committee. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is very informative and, of course, a difficult subject. I have a couple of questions. In the, when the Armenian genocide claims are presented, we always see uh, the poor Armenians' uh, innocence as they are uh, were uh, persecuted because of their ethnicity and such. The rebellions are rarely mentioned. Do you see any papers or any books bringing out the rebellions of the Armenians? Uh, are there, for example, I came across an article by uh, Uri Berberian, Rowing Revolutionaries moving between the Russian, Iranian, and Young Turk revolutions, cosmopolitan Armenians helped usher in the 20th century. So they give a, a sheen of, uh, of rebellions, uh, pioneers, uh, and they're kind of proud of it. So if they are come out with more articles and books uh, and facts with these issues, let me give a counterbalance to the genocide claims, which we know are very uh, shady. So what, what do you think of that? Have you come across any uh, books or articles about Armenians being proud of their rebellions and revolutions? Uh, there are a couple books written back in the 1950s, uh, Nazarbekian's book, for example, that, that, that talks about, about the Armenian uh, revolutionary committees. Uh, the, the current literature in our time, uh, and all of it, all of it mentions the Armenian revolutionary committees. Richard Hovacinian, Peter Balakian, Vakan Dadrian. Um, uh, all of them mention the committees. Ronald Sunni. For example, these are all, all Armenian authors. Uh, several of the Turkish authors who write from the Armenian perspective also mention the committees. But uh, let, let me go back to, to, the, to, the, to the curating of information. What information do you decide to present as important? And, and the problem with the Armenian literature from Armenian authors is, is it mentions the committees but, but it, it, never, it never mentions them as a serious threat to Ottoman logistics or Ottoman uh, national security. They're, they're presented as, as uh, it, they were justifiable in their rebellion because they were being mistreated and oppressed. But, but beyond that, the, the size of the insurgency, the location of, of the terrorist incidents, none of that is, 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 ever, is, is ever stressed. Nor, neither is, nor the, the close coordination that the Armenian committees have. They are encouraged by the Russians. They're encouraged by the British. Baghos, Nubar, and, and, and Cairo, a very important member of one of the committees, uh, is, is, is directly talking to John Maxwell, the, the British senior general in Cairo. And they're considering a landing on the coast near Iskenderim uh, to, to raise rebellion. So, so, so these are inconvenient facts. Uh, in, there's there's a, a, a phrase today, lost cause mythology. Uh, the, the, some Americans today, right-wing American white supremacists, will tell you that, that the Civil War was not about slavery. The American Civil War was about states' rights. It was about repelling an invasion from the North. It was about securing independence and freedom from 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 the north, 
Well, well, that, that's a flawed mythology. It's lost cause mythology. It's quite famous in our time. The Armenian diaspora, the Armenian authors have created a lost cause mythology in their writing where, where their selection of facts, their presentation of facts, they use the same facts I do. They use the same facts that, 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 that Turkish authors use, but they, but they present them in a different way that makes it appear that this was, this was a small thing. These these committees were were no big threat. They they, they, they were not dangerous. They they were freedom fighters. They were they were they were uh, trying trying to trying to gain autonomy from an oppressive Ottoman regime. Uh, the Ottomans were killing them only because they were Christians, for example. So so that, that's a it's a, it's a different it's a, it's a different view of the same facts. Let me end this with, with, with is it going to change anytime soon? This is this is a hundred year thing. It's been 100 years since the American Civil War. It's been, it's been 150 years. 100 and, let me give you, it's been 170 years from the American Civil War. And, 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 and we're still arguing with white supremacists, with, 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 with racists in the American South about what happened in 1860. So, so my view is, you know, if we're all still alive in, in, in 2250, Maybe, maybe there'll be a balanced narrative, but it's going to take a long time, Moya. Okay, my other question is, are you going to look into the Azeri-Armenian war and the use of the drones by the Azerbaijani forces? I mean, it's a new technique I'm hearing. Uh, I'm sure uh, it's a good subject for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny, uh, uh, Hakan Yavuz out in Salt Lake City and Mike Gunther in Tennessee uh, are, are working on a, a book for Routledge called uh, the, uh, the Karabakh Handbook. And they asked me to write a chapter on, on what's called the 44-day war, uh, which I've done. So I've written a chapter on this already, uh, and, and it's gone to them to be included in the book. It's more than drones. It's a lot more than just drones. It's it's Turkish military assistance, training, equipment. It's smart uh, acquisition decisions by the Azerbaijanis. But there's a lot more to this than, than what we're seeing on TV with, with drone strikes. Uh, I'd be happy at a future date to, to do a, pr a presentation on on the war itself. Well, how 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 did Azerbaijan win this war? And, and it was a magnificent victory. They they win hands down. They they. They come out of this war with every strategic objective met and the recovery of, of, of about two thirds of what used to be called uh, uh, Aksash, the, the Armenian breakaway republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, so yes, I am. We're definitely looking forward to it. Well, you are a huge resource. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm very tempted to ask you to do the Gallipoli in March on March 18th. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been very, very excellent lecture. As I said, it will be on YouTube. It will, I will send you the links. It will be available for a long time. The, the, very easy to access. Thank you again. Thank you for your time. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.